This is the final lecture of Chapter 6 of Data-Driven Science and Engineering by Brunton and Kutz. All the details of the book can be found here at databookuw.com, and I encourage you to go visit there. You can download all the code we've ever talked about in Python and in MATLAB, as well as find notes and lots of resources and video lectures pertaining to data-driven science. Um, I want to finish up this section or this chapter on neural nets to talk a little bit about where sort of things are right now. Where do they sit in current thinking of science and engineering? You know, neural nets are these things that have uh, kind of taken over all kinds of fields of applications. They're incredibly useful, especially if given enough data. And so neural nets can be a key enabling piece of scientific discovery. Oftentimes we draw it in this kind of architecture here where we have an input layer, uh, lots of hidden layers to an output layer with the idea of either doing some kind of reconstruction, perhaps a labeling task or a classification task. And so this is a generic picture of what a neural net might look like. Now the interesting thing is, uh, since really we've been using these heavily since the um, early 2010s, right, we've had lots of lot innovations around the kind of different architectures or structures you can impose on neural nets and train, uh, train for doing various different tasks. So this, this lecture is a little bit short, but it's going to highlight some of the different architectures that people have come up with for various application purposes. So I want to talk about is the neural network zoo. So this is a picture in the book, and it really is uh, based upon uh, an article written about neural network zoos, which is trying to highlight the different kind of architectures people have come up with for different kind of applications. And so these are the kind of, let's call them canonical representations of what neural networks look like. And sometimes what we do with these is try to understand how are they helping us to solve science problems. So you have, all these have uh, acronyms uh, because I wanted to fit it all on one page. Uh, but for instance, you know, up here you have these recurrent neural nets or sometimes subsets of LSTM are a subset of them, which is uh, long short-term memory networks. You have autoencoders, variational autoencoders. So all kinds of structures. We just talked about in the last lecture in 6.6 uh, of the book is deep convolute, or 6.5 in the book, deep convolutional neural networks. This is the kind of basic architecture it has. And so one of the questions you can ask, so why would you use one of these neural networks in different scenarios? Each one of these, for the data that they were considered with, typically exploited some feature of the data. That's the one thing you know about neural nets. If you have information about the kind of data and the kind of modeling you're trying to do, it is often to your advantage to imbue your neural network with that kind of feature so that it can more easily take advantage of it, something that you know to be true. So, for instance, let me just highlight a couple of these. I don't want to highlight all of them. In the book, you'll find key references for many of these and how they're being used in different applications. So, for instance, let's start off here with a recurrent neural net. Oftentimes, or LSTMs, these are very successful in doing forecasting of time series data. So you take a, so each one of these networks is the idea is that you, you have some kind of dynamical process producing data in time, and what the idea is to build a set of hidden units with some nonlinear functional filtering capabilities that can build a latent representation of those dynamics so that you can map you from time t to t plus 1. So you train that network to learn how to time step. And this has some very interesting features and filters that will allow this thing to be very effective in producing short time forecasts of time series data. So it's heavily used in things like speech. In fact, LSTMs are sort of the workhorse of a language, natural language processing. So when you want to actually start thinking about speech patterns, completing sentences, uh, LSTM is sort of a time series because our, our, our speech comes in more of a time series way. So LSTMs are used there heavily, but they're also used heavily in doing forecasts of dynamical systems as well, predict a future state of a system, and at least for short time forecasts, this is a very effective tool to do things like this. Let me also talk about autoencoders. Autoencoders are really thinking about figuring out a way to take a high dimensional space and represent it in some low dimensional space. 
And the idea is here, you have a latent space you're going to try to represent it in. You go from high dimensional space into latent space. And of course, you'd like to come back out. So you want a transform that takes you from your high dimensional space into a low dimensional space and back out. We capitalize on transforms all the time. We have an entire chapter of the book devoted towards thinking about transforms of data. And those transforms can often give you a coordinate system, which is much better for representing the data and dynamics you're looking at. So an autoencoder is a natural framework for taking you from a high dimensional space to, in some sense, potentially a, an optimal low dimensional subspace and back. In reduced order models, which is something we'll cover later in this book, what we do is often take and learn that low dimensional subspace by doing a singular value decomposition and projecting into the dominant singular value modes. The autoencoder, one of its great features is that I can learn a nonlinear mapping, not a linear mapping like the SVD, but a nonlinear mapping to a space where I potentially can capitalize nicely on the features there to building models. We've already talked about deep convolutional neural nets. Those are where you can take small, you take small windows, sliding them over your data. You'd use convolution and pooling together in such a way to build yourself a better model at the back end. Very uh, important for image processing. You have decoder networks. You have Boltzmann machines. Um, various different design architectures. Echo state networks is over here. Uh, generative adversarial networks here. The one I'm going to highlight here for engineering applications is this deep residual network. And the reason I'm going to highlight it is because one of its key features is that it has skip connections. So you take data from one layer and you transport it downstream to another layer. So this is very much like an identity map. So for instance, when we build, when we think about a, a differential equation in the form x dot equals f of x, one of the ways we approximate this is with Euler stepping. And Euler stepping simply says the solution in the future is what it is now plus a small correction. And in some sense, what this is has very much of the style of an Euler scheme. So for, uh, for those of us in the engineering science who think a lot about dynamics and evolving in time, these skip connections make a lot of sense because what they're doing is carrying information forward into the future, which is sort of like the identity, which is very much like an Euler stepping scheme. So each one of these, like I said, has some very interesting features that are aimed at exploiting something in your data. So you should always think about, you know, pro writing a code for a neural net, you should first ask, what's the nature of your data? What am I trying to do? And that might inform what you want to do here in terms of picking out a neural net architecture that would be most usable or uh, most advantageous for the kind of data that you would have in practice. So that's all I want to say for this. Uh, you know, the, the modern neural nets have a lot of... Uh, interesting potential. I think it's still widely untapped, but is now at the very forefront of most engineering and physical and biological sciences. People are pushing very hard. So this kind of table here will certainly be updated in short order as people across the sciences are finding strategies to leverage physical principles, biological principles, build them into their neural networks, which will change some of these structures and will start giving us new paradigms of new neural networks that we can use that maximally exploit features and structure in our data. So let's call this the physics-informed learning paradigm. You know, so obviously if you want to do images, you don't typically think about physics built in there, but if you're measuring real physical systems, you want to figure out how do I take any of these structures, which have been very successful, Put in the constraints I want that I know are there as part of the physics or partial constraints that I have where I know things like conservation of mass and momentum. How do you build these into neural net architectures to maximally exploit things you know about physics and learn the pieces that you need better knowledge about? So I'll leave that open for you as a very fun time in life to be living in the data sciences, in the engineering, physical and biological sciences. There's so much fertile ground for exploration, and I think that you will have a great time uh, if you choose to explore those kind of problems. 
Again, I'll point you to the book, uh, databook.uw.com. You can find more resources here, more lectures on data-driven science and engineering, Brian and Kutz, and also you can find a copy of the book notes or of the, of the manuscript itself. There it is, databook.uw.com, databook.pdf. You can download everything. All the code is there, so get to play around with it and have fun doing your science and engineering with all these new data-driven tools.